Welcome everybody. Um, I'm glad you could all join us here online. Instead, unfortunately, we're not in um, sunny Valencia, but uh, we'll try and get through as much as we can of the, the program we had uh, scheduled for you there. Um, please go on, Nicholas. So I'm just going to talk very quickly um, about what DVBI is and, and where we're at and how we got here. Well, obviously, you all hopefully would know that DVB has been around in the broadcasting space for quite a number of years, 25 plus years now. And on the way here to where we are today, we've done a lot of work with terrestrial broadcast services. You can see cable, terrestrial and satellite services using DDB technologies. And then historically, we've been adding on to those spaces. So we've added on uh, a lot of technologies and, and HUBTV has been the an outcome of one of those. Um, and then we've also had a lot, done a lot of work with IPTV in the past and so a lot of the experience we've had in there running IP content over managed networks has helped us understand all the different facets that, that there could possibly be in, in, run, in delivering um, linear television services over the, the very big IP network which is of course the internet. So DVBI then rolls up as a project and a set of technologies and lots of other aspects um, to actually make, the, make it possible for you to, to deliver broadcast television services over internet technologies uh, that we see and use today. For, for everything else, those same technologies that we're using for this, this webinar, that we make phone calls on, that we can surf the, the internet on, um, same underlying infrastructures, nothing special on top of those, uh, but delivering video uh, en masse. So what's in the, the, the ecosystem then? Uh, we're gonna be talking a lot today about the, the DVB A177 Blue Book, uh, that's the specification for service discovery metadata and, and program information metadata, the, the content guide, um, lots of things that we've uh, had before. And these are what really give us um, the, 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 the fundamental first port of call, if you like, um, for television services. We, I don't, it's not the, you know, it's just a way, it makes a way for us to be able to find services uh, that we may not normally be able to get. We can't do a channel scan on the internet. Um, historically. So this is a way to do a channel scan likes, like function uh, there. Uh, two days ago, I think it was on Monday, we talked a lot more about DVB-A168, which is DVB dash, and it's low latency. So that's our technologies for delivering the, the linear services. Once you've found them and selected them on your device, uh, you can deliver them that way. Um, A176 is our blue book around multicast ABR. So that's how to efficiently deliver content across that network, trying to find ways that we can uh, optimize the delivery using multicast technology in some parts of the network and unicast in other parts of the network without interfering with the quality of service and, and the user experience as a whole. And then of course we have uh, a lot of work going on at the moment around targeted advertising, uh, how we personalize the television experience. We can obviously with, with some of the DVBI work and the apps, we can personalize the content experience and the user interface parts. And so here we'll be able to, we'll be able to personalize the um, ad insertion aspects as well. Can you just go on, Nicholas? Okay, so um, this is my very crude uh, draw on the wall type of diagram. Um, I'm not known for my great diagrams, but I try to get the story across. Fundamentally, these are all the building blocks that we have in, in a DVBI system uh, when we're talking about things. We On the right, we have the client, which would be a a mobile phone, a television set, uh, a, a laptop, a tablet, something which is actually connecting up to the networks, whether they're broadcast networks or broadband networks, and, and presenting the services to people. Obviously that has a, a connection to a service discovery function I talked about for the sort of internet channel scan. And then we have lists of services. Every country, every region uh, may have one or many different service lists, and Nicholas is gonna talk about those today. And then they boil down into the services themselves. So this is all gives us the, the, the meat and potatoes that we can uh, for a service. Services then can also give content guide information. We still wanna have those EPGs. We still wanna have all that, those channel banners and everything else. So that's the other part that sort of forms the basis of what a DVBI system is. Uh, next, Nicholas. So today we're gonna to talk about these areas. Uh, yesterday, uh, sorry, on Monday, we talked about a low latency CDN and, and those big lines at the bottom. Um, I think next week, we're going to talk a lot more about the DVB client itself and, and how that might go together. But today, we're focusing on these yellow parts. And so I'm going to hand over to Nicholas to uh, talk to you about those.
Thanks, Paul. Okay. So, um, thank you for joining this webinar. Um, we'll go over four main topics in today's presentation. Um, first of all, we'll touch upon uh, aggregating services into service lists and the uh, challenges uh, related to that. Um, then we'll cover discovery of service lists by client devices. Um, the third part will be diving more into the details of service lists and the data model. Uh, we'll do that through some examples. And then finally, we'll touch upon the content guide metadata. So first of all, aggregating services into service lists. So the service list is, is really critical. Um, it's the document the client uses to configure its access to all the services that can come from one or more providers and be delivered using different delivery methods. This document will determine how easy it is to access the services, uh, depending on the type of client device, um, the prominence of the services, the ordering of the channels, um, where their target is at or when their target is at, um, potentially figure related subscriptions, as well as additional metadata to enrich the uh, user experience, logos, event information, and of course, linked applications. So the services provider is really an essential role um, because they're in control of all the aggregation of this, of this uh, metadata or the access to this metadata. So who is the services provider? Um, well, it can be a number of existing entities depending on the particular deployment uh, that it's targeted. So it is very flexible technology. Um, it could be a broadcaster, a network operator, and so on. Um, and it can be used to target all kinds of different ecosystem, whether it's a horizontal ecosystem, vertical ecosystem, or a smaller community group. Now, this services provider is facing essentially the same challenges operators face today in terms of reconciling all these different requests from the providers they're working with, regulatory requirements, business interests, the needs of the user, delivering the, um, the creating a service system that makes sense. Um, the main difference is, of course, that with EVBI, um, you have additional separation between the discovery of the service list and the delivery of the, of the content itself. Um, and this means that um, it's particularly important to guarantee the authenticity of the services and to ensure that the accuracy of the metadata, to ensure the accuracy of the metadata in the service list. This is a particularly key role, a uh, key part of the, the service list provider's role. So in a way, it's all about trust. The viewer will trust the client device they're using. That device will have to trust the service list provider that's providing the, uh, the service list itself. And of course, all the providers, the service and content providers will have to trust the service list provider to integrate their services in the correct and accurate way. Now, DVBI provides technical tools for this, of course. Um, in addition to that, there are oper operational procedures, many of which are in use today. And um, regulation, for example, may confer an additional trusted um, status to some services providers. So regarding the technical tools, at least, um, well, DVBI, as uh, Paul mentioned earlier, is built upon internet friendly standards. So essentially, we're bringing together a set of existing technical building blocks. And by doing this, we benefit from all the existing experience and best practices out there related to this technology. Um, and why? Well, the main goal is to ensure that all of this metadata that's transiting back and forth is done so uh, privately, that it's not tampered with, and that it's from the entities that you expect it to be from. So uh, to that end, we use HTTPS for all metadata queries and responses, and clients are expected to support TLS version 1.3. We also provide some recommendations on DNS security. So let's, uh, talking of, of exchanging metadata, let's move into um, the discovery of service lists. So to discover service lists, there are three main methods. The first is built in or in um, pre-provisioning of the service list. The next is um, using the broadcast signal to signal uh, the location of the service list. And the third is the service list registry. So be, to be able to query such a registry to discover available service lists. So pre-provisioning is pretty self-evident. A client device manufacturer or a client application developer um, can integrate um, known service list URLs or service list registry URLs into their 
uh, device or application. Um, we talked about who may be the provider of the service list. So the manufacturer or our developer would work with them um, to uh, determine what that URL is and to um, pre-provision it in their, in their product. Um, this is, there are many examples of this today. Um, manufacturers working with operators and broadcasters um, who have particular requirements, um, and this could be just an additional requirement. So as a starting point, this is extremely workable, uh, workable solution. But of course, there are more dynamic solutions um, and more, um, let's say, future-proof solutions as well. Uh, so using the broadcast uh, signal is one. So um, in the broadcast signal, using a URI linkage descriptor in the first loop of the NIT or the BAT, um, you can signal either a DVBI service list URL or a query to a service list registry, which provides additional flexibility uh, to the um, services provider and operator. And finally, uh, of course, the service list registry. Um, so a queryable network function to discover service lists. So let's look at um, how that query and uh, what that query consists of. So of course, you still have to start from a known uh, service list registry endpoint, um, the URL, um, which may have been communicated in one of the two previous methods. And to this endpoint, you add uh, a number of parameters depending on what you're looking for. So you could be looking for service lists from a particular country or with services targeting a particular language, a particular provider, genre, or even um, service lists that are um, from a particular regulator. So all of this can be signaled and these parameters can be combined. So let's look at an example. Um, for example, let's look at, say I'm looking for English language services uh, in Germany. So by submitting such a query to a services registry, I would get back an XML document that looks like this. So at the root, you have this services entry points element. And within that, you have the um, contact information for the operator of the registry, so the services registry entity. And then you have a provider offering and element for each of the um, services providers who are making, uh, who, uh, for, for whom content is available from this query. So in this case, you have one provider, you have their contact information, and then you have all of their service list offerings that meet the query um, criteria. So in this case, there's one service list offering. You have the name, um, and now as throughout the entire spec, um, names can be provided in multiple languages to, um, so which can be convenient for um, different menu languages and client devices. And of course, the, list, the link to the, uh, the service list itself. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the target language and country is men mentioned here as well. So that's one example of uh, a service list registry query result. And of course, we talked about trust. Well, if you're using a service list registry, um, this is an extra layer in that, in that model. So a, a client device would have to trust this registry to provide accurate um, and reliable information. Um, and of course, uh, that might involve certain procedures and processes uh, that that registry uses when integrating services providers. So we've looked at how service list can be discovered. Let's look at what's actually in the service list and how you go from a service list to a channel list. So service lists um, contain a, a set of different, different types of, uh, of metadata. And so through some examples now, we'll, we'll see how all of this is described. So uh, a service list, uh, put simply, is an ordered collection of services. Um, each service is an editorial representation of a television service. Um, and we, we specifically mention editorial representation because we separate out the different delivery uh, methods uh, into service instances. And each of those instances will deliver the same editorial content. If the editorial content is different, then it's a different service. So we'll look at three uh, different examples. Um, first, we'll start out with a hybrid service list. So the top level element service list looks like this. So um, first of all, a service list will have a version. 
Uh, now this version attributes uh, is important for clients to detect when the list itself is updated. So this will be incremented when the services provider makes an update. The next, uh, next uh, information is of course the name of the, the list itself and the provider name, which can be used by the client in its UI together with a logo. Um, now this logo is, is provided via this related material element. Um, the how related element with the classification scheme indicated here indicates to the client that this is a service uh, services logo. So it's that 1001.1 classification that, that indicates the type of asset that's being provided. Next, you can have regions. So these are defined in what's called a region list. Uh, now in this first example, it's the very, the simplest example possible where you have simply one region. So in this case, it's the, the region Italy um, with, country, with its country code and its identifier, which can be used um, elsewhere to reference this region. The region name element here is provided uh, so as the client can um, offer this region in its region selection screen. The target region element below it um, because this is defined at the services level, means that this entire service list is targeted at this region, so at the region Italy. We'll look at some more uh, detailed targeting later on. Then we have the LCN tables, uh, defining the mapping between services and uh, channel numbers. So in this case, you just have one LCN table inside this LCN table list, and uh, then the services. So we'll go into detail uh, for these a bit later. In fact, we'll go into detail on the services immediately. So, service. Um, the first important uh, element of a service is its unique identifier. So this enables the mapping of this service, well, to LCNs, as we just saw, but also to content guide metadata. This is the, uh, so this is a very important, uh, very, very important identifier. Now, let's go into a bit more detail on it briefly. Um, DBBI recommends uh, to use this particular uh, scheme to define it, uh, defined in IETF uh, RFC 4151. Um, but it is required to use a registered URI scheme uh, that allows independent allocation. Um, obviously, there's no central uh, registry or authority that allocates all of these unique IDs. Um, but ideally, we want to ensure global uniqueness. Um, and, if, uh, because and this will help the client devices manage multiple service lists in particular. So in this example, you have the, uh, the tag prefix, you've got the tagging entity, which is a DNS name, so ride.it, with the, uh, the date it was defined, the, what, the year in this case, followed by the specific uh, element um, specific to the service itself, ride-3. So next you have uh, service name, so also very important because this is what will be uh, used to uh, represent the service uh, in, the, uh, in the UI of the client and the channel list and other uh, UI elements. Uh, also the provider name, uh, a logo, so this, in this case it's a channel logo. Uh, next you have the channel, uh, the service type. Uh, so this is a linear service, but it could be on demand, data service or other. You can signal the genre of the service. So this particular classification was taken from EN 300-468, so the DVSI specification, uh, the content descriptor. Um, but uh, you can also use any a number of other uh, classification schemes here. It's quite flexible. Uh, and then finally, you can have the service instances for this service. And we'll go into those in a bit more detail later. So um, before we move on, uh, also I just want to come back to this uh, ref related material element. Um, so this can also be used to signal linked applications such as HPVTV applications uh, shown here. Here you can see there's the link to the application AIT with its uh, associated content type. Um, and you'll see that there's, there's a different uh, class classification scheme used for the how related element. So this linked application classification scheme uh, determines what type of application is provided here. So there are three types defined. Um, the first is an application uh, launched uh, in parallel to media playback. So essentially when the service is selected, playback of the media will start and the application will launch at the same time. The second type is when uh, the application is launched and then the application itself will determine and control media playback. 
And finally, you have a type of application that's used when the service is not available. So uh, well, later on, we'll, we'll look at uh, availability, but um, when a service is not available, um, a client could choose to, um, well, there could be client-specific behavior, of course. Um, there could be an out-of-banner, out-of-service banner shown, some sort of fixed graphics. Or um, this type of application could be launched. So a, specific, a, type, of, a type of application specific um, to uh, when the service is not, is not live, not available. Right, so uh, after the, looking at the service definition, uh, let's look at the LCN table briefly. It's relatively simple. So this defines the mapping between the service and the channel number um, using the unique service ID. So very straightforward. You have this, so you have this uh, LCN element which contains multiple attributes. Um, so the two essential ones are the channel number you want to assign and the service, uh, the ID of the service you're assigning it to. And then you have the selectable and visible attributes, um, so which determine whether or not this channel will be visible in the channel list. And if it's not visible, then it determines whether or not it can be selected using direct LCN entry. Now, before we move on, I also want to just mention targeting, um, so region and subscription targeting specifically. So you can target, um, you can ensure that uh, certain services are targeted at a region or a subscription package. You can also do this at LCN table level as well. So a particular LCN table can be targeted at a region or a subscription package using these elements. So target region we saw a bit earlier, um, and this contains the identifier of a region. And uh, it's the same for a subscription package. So this would be a known identifier um, that will be defined by the, the subscription uh, package provider. So uh, now after that, let's move on to service instances, the final piece of the puzzle. So in this, uh, these examples, we'll look at a DVBS example and then a Dash example. So first DVBS, uh, so you'll see here there's a priority uh, attribute. Now, if there's only one service instance, um, no priority is needed, of course. But if there are multiple instances, um, if the services provider and the service provider do not want the client to decide, they can specify this the priority. Um, and so the lower the value of this attribute, the higher the priority. So one is a higher priority to two, following that logic. So after the priority, you have delivery parameters, of course, very important. These define um, yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the details of how uh, to receive this service. So in the case of DVBS, you have the, uh, the DVB triplets, the orbital position, frequency, and polarization and uh, the source type above, which uh, echoes that. You can also define content attributes. So these can be useful for a client, um, particularly a TV uh, device, to determine in advance uh, whether or not it can play the content. So you'll see here, there's a video conformance point mentioned. This uh, can reference conformance points defined um, in DVB's audio video coding specification. So TS101154. Uh, and so this can be very helpful for, to a TV to know does it, whether it supports the, the bitstream profile uh, used by this service. It can also uh, contain information on so, uh, audio encoding and uh, languages and uh, accessibility as well. So subtitles and uh, sign language available. Moving on to the Dash instance. Uh, so you also have the priority here. So this is higher priority than the previous instance. Again, the delivery parameters um, with the appropriate content type uh, for the uh, MPD. Content attributes again, and this time the conformance point is, uh, is, the, uh, is appropriately uh, adapted for Dash. And finally, an example of uh, out of service banner with the, with the um, power related classification for out of service banner. So yeah, uh, it would look like this uh, all together in the uh, service list. And you've got your LCM tables, your service uh, element containing the, your, so the unique identifier that maps to the channel number and the two service instances. So we've gone over an example of a hybrid uh, service list that's defining a single channel list combining multiple delivery methods, so IP and, and uh, satellite in this case. 
Uh, now, for a client, um, a hybrid client, um, mapping the Dash instance to a particular service and channel number is relatively straightforward. But for broadcast, it's a bit more complicated. So in the case of broadcast, the client will have performed a scan uh, of the uh, broadcast signal it's receiving, and it will have found certain services. And it needs to be able to map the correct service among those with the information that is delivered in this, in this DVBI service list XML document. So to ensure that mapping is done correctly and that the correct service is, is, is associated with this channel so that there's no uh, mismatch and you get the wrong content when selecting the channel in that case, to ensure this goes correctly, um, the DVBI specification defines a certain mapping procedure. So essentially, the client will have to match the metadata that is defined with the information that it is, that it is discovered in its channel scan. So in this case, it's satellite channel scan. So if all of this information matches, then it can confidently associate the service that matched from its channel scan with this channel, ensuring that the user, the viewer, gets the correct content. Uh, and then, so in this case, you'd end up with two different instances, each with a different priority. So when the user chooses this channel from the channel list, um, the, by default, it would be the Dash instance that's played. If this Dash instance for some reason was not available, perhaps uh, the, 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 the TV has lost connectivity. Um, in that case, uh, it can fall back to the other instance. And all of this is done without user intervention, just in seamlessly. So let's move on to a bit more uh, detailed example of regionalization. So regionalization can be done, uh, can target viewers at different uh, geographic levels. So we saw in the previous example, uh, a country uh, targeting, country level targeting. Um, this can be done down to roughly city level uh, targeting. Um, and the way this targeting is described in the metadata can be done at different levels as well. So we saw that the uh, in the previous example it was at the service list level that the region was targeted well it can also be done at uh, service level and lcm table level as i did mention uh, when i'm when i showed the lcm table so here we'll look at a more detailed lcm table uh, regional targeting example so here you see the, the so again the same service list except this time the region list is uh, has been expanded so you not only have the uh, the, the highest level region for the country, Italy. You also have two sub-level regions for the Piemonte and Lombardia regions. So each of them have the region name so that the client device can show those in its UI for selection. They also define postcode ranges. Now this can be used to uh, automate the region selection. If the client device can perform geolocation and, and derive the postcode, then it can automatically select the correct region or it could simply ask the user to enter their postcode. It can also uh, provide coordinates here as well um, instead of postcodes. So it can actually be very uh, precise. So now we've seen how to um, define more detailed regions. Let's see how those map to LCN tables. It's pretty straightforward. Um, I did mention it briefly before. So using the target region elements um, in the LCN table itself, you can associate, um, so in this case, the Piemonte region with this particular LCM table. And so here, the Rai 3 Piemonte variant is associated with channel three, um, but viewers in Lombardia with a different target region and different LCM table will get the different, uh, a different Rai 3 variant um, on channel three. So next example, is availability windows. So availability windows can be defined uh, for service instances. So this is linked to the delivery method. Uh, and these, uh, these availability windows can define uh, periods of availability. So with a start date and time and an end date and time, or they can define intervals. So for example, um, every Monday and Tuesday from five till 6 p.m. every other week. So it can be very, uh, very precise depending on uh, the recurrence of the, uh, of the particular availability window. So in this example, uh, so here we're looking at a dash service instance. Um, we have this availability element in the middle. 
with an interval um, defining a start time, an end time, and the days it's available. So first, so this uh, instance, again, so still has the highest priority as in the previous example. Uh, one additional uh, element I wanted to introduce here was the display name. So when this particular dash instance is selected, this display name element can be used to override service name. So wherever the service name is shown in the UI, it would be replaced with this particular display name when this instance is selected. Um, and so yeah, to get back to the availability window, so this defines this, this uh, interval, uh, so every day, uh, so you see on the right, the uh, days attribute uh, defines the days this, this is, uh, applies to. So here it's every single day of the week, Monday to Sunday. And the time frame, so half past five to six in UTC, so zero time. And yeah, okay, the out of service banner is here too. So, okay, that's just how it would look like uh, in the XML, just a brief overview with each instance. So when the user, concretely, when the user selects channel three, uh, initially uh, the RI3 DVBS instance would be selected because although the dvb dash instance has a higher priority it's not available yet when the uh when it gets to half past five the switch the the client will automatically switch to the dash instance which becomes available you see that the display display name is used and then at the end of that availability window at six uh, the client automatically switches back to the dvbs instance so that's was um, an overview of uh, the service list metadata with, a, with those three examples. So I don't know, um, Owen, uh, do we want to take any questions at this point or shall we move on to with the content metadata? Um, let's keep going, Nicholas, for now and uh, we'll deal with all of the questions at the end. Great, okay. So next we'll get into the content metadata. So this is linked to services um, and uh, as its name implies, provides the, uh, the uh, program information for, um, yeah, for, for use in an EPG or a channel change banner. So the API uh, that's defined can offer basic or enhanced schedule information. Um, it can, in the, in the extreme, define up to the next 28 days and the past 28 days. And it offers some specific queries uh, that can be quite useful. For example, the now next query, uh, that's one of the most common uh, sets of metadata that you'd want to retrieve. Uh, and we'll go into the other types as well a bit later. Um, it also offers deep linking to uh, IP streams and applications for playback of on-demand content associated with past events. And um, it can also offer, of course, uh, images uh, to enrich the, uh, the EPG uh, interface. So that's what it offers. Now, how is this described in uh, the service list so that a client device can access it? Well, it's described in what we call a content guide source element. Uh, so I'll go into where this, is, where this is located in just a moment. But so this, first of all, I'll go through what this contains. So a content guide source. So first of all, it has an, at, an attribute uh, with an identifier, a unique identifier within the service list. Uh, and this is used to reference this content guide source. Um, and the reason you'd want to do this is so that multiple services can make use of the same uh, content guide source. Um, next, it has a name and a provider name, which may be used in, in the user interface. Uh, also a logo. And most important, uh, the endpoints. So uh, the mandatory endpoint, so the, the most basic essential information for any uh, content guide source is the schedule info endpoint. So this is the endpoint that provides the uh, combined schedule information for a single service. Um, and this will be a basic level of information and it may contain linear and on-demand program information. If you want to get more detailed information for a single program, uh, you can then use the program info endpoint if it's available um, to request that detailed information. Next up is the group info endpoint. So this one uh, can be used to request uh, um, yeah, groups of, of content. Um, and so the way this is broken down is you have categories of content. Within those categories, you can have uh, series or box sets as they might be called. 
and uh, within those you can have multiple episodes. So this can be made, uh, can can be useful to make available on demand content, particularly. And finally, you have the more episodes endpoint. So this can be uh, useful if you've just watched an episode of something uh, and you want to to get the the episodes related to that program. So this defines all of the different information in this in this content guide source uh, how to access it. So now we need to see how is this associated with the services. So a content guide source, so what we just saw, can be defined at the service list level. Um, and if that's if you just have a content guide source defined in the service list uh, and nothing more, then the assumption is that can be used for all the services. You could also define multiple uh, content guide sources for use uh, by all the services. Uh, and to do that, you would use the content guide source list element here. And inside of that, you would put multiple content guide sources. So if you have more than one, then in the service level, you use a content guide source ref here to uh, reference the particular identifier, so the CGSID of the content guide source that that service uses. You could also define a content guide source directly uh, within a service element as well. So it's extremely flexible and you can, uh, this caters for um, yeah, all the different use cases, whether it's a common content guide source or specific content guide sources for individual services. So that's where it's defined and how to link a service to a particular source of content guide data. Now, I mentioned the unique ID earlier. So this is indeed used to, uh, in the queries um, to reference a particular, to identify a particular service. There's also uh, an additional uh, element called the content guide service ref. Now, what this does is provides a bit more flexibility. So let's say, for example, you have multiple services that are regional variants of the same service. As we saw in the previous example for Rye 3, you may have multiple regional variants. But let's say they share all share the same content guide data. So you don't really want to have to handle the, the additional complexity of duplicating uh, the content guide data in, in the content guide service. So by using the content guide service reference, all of these services can share the same content guide metadata. So all of them will have the same content guide service ref. So they all have different unique IDs, but the same content guide service ref. So that provides additional flexibility. Um, it could also be used, for example, if you have a different uh, identifier scheme uh, within the content guide uh, service data as well. So let's move on now to the actual requests themselves. Um, so first of all, the schedule info endpoint, so the, the basic uh, schedule data for a particular service. So first of all, you have the endpoint that's defined uh, in the content guide service uh, source that we saw uh, previously. So this schedule info endpoint here. So that is taken and used here. And to that you append a multiple, uh, well, one or well, yeah, multiple parameters. So of course you need to define the uh, time period you're requesting with the start and end parameters. Uh, the, the service ID, of course, is very important. Um, and you can also define an image variant parameter. So this uh, enables clients to request image assets that are better suited to their particular UI. So the way they integrate the uh, EPG data into their UI could be monochrome, it could be lighter colors or darker colors. And so if the content guide uh, service has those different variants available, it will provide them. Uh, in addition to this uh, schedule info endpoint, standard info endpoint request, um, you can also specify a specific now next request. And so this is really practical. You just have to specify the identity of the serve, the ID of the service, and now next equals true, and you get the current service and the next future service in the metadata response. And so below are a couple of examples shown. So you see the URL escaped tags uh, in the SID parameter, the start and end time in Unix time. And uh, yeah, below that you have a now next example. So let's have a look at the response data. Uh, so this is usually, this is based on the TV anytime specification uh, and which separates out the information on the editorial content, so in the program information table, 
from the information on where to uh, where to find that content, so the program location table, which is the schedule information and the on-demand information. So uh, TV, uh, TVA, uh, a bit of TVA XML. So you have the TVA main route, and within there you have those those two structures I talked about. So the uh, program description, and inside the program information table, and the program location table. So first the program information table which defines the uh, the information on the different different programs editorial content so here's just one example um, so uh, you have the uh, a title of course of the program the main title uh, with a short synopsis because this is not the detailed information uh, de when you do a detailed information request you get much but you could get much more content here so this is a medium length synopsis um, you also have and very importantly the uh, program IDs or the CRID uh, which uniquely identifies this program uh, within all of the content guide data. So, for example, when when you're this this can be used to request more details for this particular program, and it can be used to link the editorial details here with the schedule and on-demand information. So, this program ID CRID is very important. Um, so, as you see here as well, you have the genre which is defined and um, a program a promotional still image. That can be used uh, can be shown in the EPG. So that was the editorial information. Now the, the schedule information. So here you see the link with the service ID um, from the channel list. Uh, sorry, the yeah, well, the service list, I should say, uh, and uh, the start and end time of the uh, events provided. So again, you find back the the CRID here of the associated the program uh, associated with this particular event. Um, you have the uh, instance description. So this is basically information on the audio and the video attributes, uh, languages, and uh, accessibility services. Of course, the public, the, the start time of the event and how long it will last for. Right, and then of course you can have also on-demand uh, programs as well. So here's one example. Um, again, the link with the uh, the editorial uh, program description. URLs, uh, so a deep links to uh, launch the application that will play the content. The description of the uh, of the instance. So again, uh, as before, the audio and video attributes. Um, what's new here are the, the two genre elements. These are used to indicate whether the media is available at this time and whether uh, it's part of a forward EPG or not. So you also, of course, have how the period of availability of this of this media and um, how it's delivered and whether or not it's free. So that's one example um, of of um, of response of metadata response. Um, so to finish up, let's have a look at just a, a couple of other examples of uh, of request. So to get detailed program information, you can use the uh, the program info endpoint, uh, as, as, I, as I mentioned earlier. So the CRID that we, we just saw uh, would be used here to, uh, to indicate the program you want more detailed information for, and the image variant uh, parameter can optionally be included. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, so the, at, the, uh, at the end of the slide there, you can see how that would look. Um, when, uh, when, yeah, when submitting such a request. As another example, uh, if you wanted to ask for more episodes of a particular program uh, to catch up some episodes you missed, perhaps you can. Uh, so the client can submit a query with again the, the CRID of the program, uh, type on demand, and the region the uh, the client is currently in. So this would be the ID ID of the region uh, selected um, from the region list defined in the service list. And you can see at the bottom there an example of how that would look, say so for the channel, this, this fictitious channel seven, um, the, the program with that CRID, um, and in the, the region, uh, let's say, uh, just for example, a region of the north, the north of England, um, let's say the identifier was this, uh, well, that's how such a request would look like. And so there we go. Um, thank you very much for your attention, and um, I'd be happy to answer uh, any questions people may have. 
Many thanks to you, Nicholas, uh, for that excellent webinar. I'm pleased to say we had more than 100 people following uh, throughout there, so um, plenty of interest in this topic. Uh, plenty of interest and indeed several questions for you to deal with. Now, you have addressed some of these already in, uh, in the presentation. Um, and indeed, John Pising has, uh, has, is, is online to the chair of our technical module and has typed answers in a couple of cases. Let's go to those that haven't been answered first. Richard uh, is asking, is postcode targeting limited to numeric zip code ranges or does it also support alphanumeric postcode prefixes? Uh, yes, so no, that is that is uh, supported indeed. We, we um, when when we the specification was written, we uh, did um, quite an exhaustive look at how all the different formats of postcode uh, that you might find in the field. Uh, and so yes, that is indeed supported. Okay. Oh, and I just I just uh, uh, Paul, yes. <laughs> yeah, I just add something on there. Uh, so we have obviously individual postcodes and ranges like Nicholas showed there, but the, an alphanumeric or numeric but also the possibility to sort of do a wildcard matching on some parts. So yes. you know, not all postcodes, um, uh, you know, postcodes can define quite a large geographic region. Uh, RG2, where I am, for example. So even though there's a, more that goes on beyond that, um, we, you can wildcard match that as well. Yeah, exactly. So here you have these, these postcode range elements. You could just specify a postcode element um, with, as Paul mentioned, a, a wildcard or a, a specific postcode as well. Yes. Right, I think that answers that question uh, comprehensively. Remo is asking, how can we signal event streams, which are sometimes planned 30 minutes before broadcast? Is the availability window the right tool for this? Um, so, <laughs> we don't, we're, we're not using event streams in, in that sort of case. So the availability window that we have defined here is for, um, switching programs at certain times and not really for anything more spontaneous than that. So it's, it's pre-established changeovers uh, is what we're using these availability windows for. Um, exactly, because it's defined in the service list and not in the, the guide data. So um, more spontaneous events um, um, may, would have to use a different mechanism. Okay. That's something perhaps for the uh, for the group uh, to consider. Um, well, I, I think I think it depends. Do you switch services at at pre-programmed times or on events, or or do you change programs in within a service on a on a schedule or on a on an event basis? So, those are the the um, uh, the topics to look at. And in this case, it's about changing services. Um, but uh, um, we may also look at it from a program perspective through the EPG metadata. Exactly. So if it, that, that certainly would already be supported if an event would be uh, defined. Um, the client would poll and retrieve that event and um, the, the, the viewer could then switch to the appropriate, uh, appropriate channel to view it. Thank you. Um, a question from uh, Francesc here. Is is the switching, and this is something indeed that we, we uh, were looking at when we demonstrated uh, DVBI serviceless back at IBC last year, is the switching from something like DVBS to DVB dash foreseen to be smooth or will it be through a black screen like when we switch between channels? So I think this is something that will be obviously to a certain degree client specific. Um, um, but um, because the switching is intended to be at program boundaries, um, I, I believe that it could be done in, in quite a in, a, in a relatively seamless manner. Um, but of course, seamless is a subjective uh, term and it will depend on, on different implementations from different, uh, and different uh, clients. Well, and and let, me, let me just chip in on something there. So I think Nicholas showed an example where you had um, two two service instances of the same editorial content with different priorities. And um, I, I forget which order he actually had them, but if the, if the satellite, I previously used to live in the United States and in the south of the US. So if the satellite was the first priority and the dash was the second priority, then obviously when I choose that service, um, I would be picking up the satellite signal. If the satellite signal went away because uh, we had lots of thunderstorms where I, where I live, 
then the client could then determine there's a service interruption on that instance and then pick up another priority, uh, the second priority instance. Uh, of course, you know, coding delays and everything else, there may or may not be it may not be a seamless experience and we're not expecting to, we're not anticipating at the moment to look at uh, frame accurate transitions uh, exactly, between those yes. two. Also because it, it sometimes may take a little while for the, the notification that the satellite signal is lost to actually come up to the client application. Um, so there, there's normally some timing interruptions there as well. Fortunately, you will still be able to continue watching your television or receiver device. Your television device would just switch on to the internet traffic and, and pick up that same programming, which could be a football match or whatever it might have been, um, off, off terrestrial off, uh, internet service. Exactly. The important thing is it's, it doesn't require user intervention. It will be done in, in a clean way. Um, how seamless it is will depend, as, as Paul mentioned. So that's if, 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 if indeed Frances' question is about the automated switching. If it's about the channel changing and zapping through, I mean, I think we've seen in the demonstrations that it, it's, it's, it's fairly smooth and acceptable and it's, it's within what we're used to uh, when zapping through channels at home. Uh, right. on whatever services we use right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. A question, oh, and I so, should mention so me, Mon me. Monday's uh, webinar, by the way, next Monday's webinar is on client. Uh, right. so, so indeed, there may be some content there that's relevant. And let, let, me, just, let me just reiterate the point. What's in the, in the service list and all this metadata which Nicholas has shown us today is to, to allow, help the client make decisions. What actually, we're not telling the client what it has to do and and, and this specification makes no requirements on the behavior of that application. And you'll hear that again uh, next week when we talk about it some more. So yeah. what, the, what the application does when it sees two service instances is entirely up to the application. It could choose to ignore one. It could choose not to do the monitoring for signal loss. That's, that's a behavior which is beyond the scope of metadata itself. Good. Uh, another question from Richard. Uh, when querying schedule metadata, is there any guidance on quantizing the start and end times in requests to improve the cacheability of results in CDNs? Yes. Um, so we, um, Paul will correct me if I'm wrong, but off the top of my head, I believe it's every, it's half an hour, uh, half an hour segments, right, I think. Um, oh, I, I, it, 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 is, it is defined in the specification, and yes, we do define um, the uh, the granularity of the of the requests of the time values. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not even sure if it's half. I think it might be you request three hour blocks, which are oh, right. okay. starting from noon, three p.m., um, etc. So yeah. those are the that's the sort of defined, block yes. size you're requesting. And again, so, as Richard points out, to improve cacheability across the network. Yeah. Few more questions here coming in uh, before we finish up. Nigel is asking, um, unless there is a platform available to a client, the ability to acquire a service list from each service provider would be complicated for a client, wouldn't it? Kind of leading question. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Not necessarily. Um, yes and no, I think. Yeah, go ahead, Nicholas. No, well, uh, I'm happy to let you answer, Paul, but uh, I'll just briefly say, I would say not necessarily. Um, if a client want, wishes to support certain services, it can work with those service providers. Um, and at the end of the day, if you know if you know the URL to access those service lists, then that's basically as much as you need to do. Now, the ma maintaining that when you have more and more providers of DVBI service lists, it does get the obviously at, at some point it would be more interesting to have um, some kind of repository. But I believe it's certainly manageable. But Paul, uh, you may have some more to say. Yeah, I, I think it's, I mean, obviously the specification that we've been working on um, envisages there being some sort of places that are known and you can go to. Um, and obviously this, uh, all of the DVB work and is theoretical and if we, we describe a lot of things, how people go along and realize those um, is, is really up to the industry. So we certainly hope that someone uh, we'll find the, the rationale to stand up uh, something that would, would do that uh, first port of call for discovering service lists. 
Thank you both. Um, now, as we hurtle towards the €64,000 question that I see coming up, I'll just mention that Thomas had asked a question about um, uh, broadcast services alongside uh, DVB, alongside broadband services or DVBI services. Equally, Hervé had asked something there uh, about whether the TV set could rely only on DVBI information and, and wouldn't physically uh, scan. So in the first, John Pising has typed answers to both of those questions, which uh, you can see there. But as he says, broadcast channel scan is unchanged. And as you described, Nicholas, the, the DVBI service list contains information to cross-reference the broadcast in instance of a service with a dash instance of the same uh, service. And in yes. detail, yep. And he also points out that the, the DVBI services doesn't contain all the information needed to avoid doing a channel scan or equivalent. But we could say that, which I think maybe what Hervé is, is asking there, we could say that indeed a, a TV could just be connected to the internet and not have any broadcast antenna or receiver. And in that case, correct it. It wouldn't do a physical scan. It would just do the scan of, of, of whatever service list it was programmed to point towards. So yeah, well, that's true. If it's if it's only dash uh, service instances, um, and of course, yeah, as as, as John already said, um, obviously there are there's a lot of optimization um, in uh, the ch existing channel scans broadcast signals um, that would not be uh, it would not be as as practical to rely on this metadata. Um, so um, Stefano has asked, will the Q&A be available on the website? I will post just a little document with those, uh, with those answers from, from John Pising uh, on the website also. The slides are now available there. And of course, the video will include all of the answers that Paul and Nicholas have given here. As I say, the 64,000 euro question from Miko, um, how is market adaptation going? Who will control the service lists and when will TVs uh, TV support become available time-wise? Uh, that's a very good question. <laughs> Paul. Okay, all right, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll at least have a first go at it. Um, so the spec was, we first published this specification as a DVB blue book back in uh, November. Um, well, obviously we're doing a lot of work at the moment to help incubate that, that technology. Uh, we've, we'll be working on it. We are working on a reference client implementation, which you would have seen if you were in Barcelona um, and you will see it at IBC when that goes ahead. We're working on tools and technologies and everything else right now to, to help motivate the market and move it forward. Uh, we're seeing a lot of services uh, being delivered as, as Dash, as DVB Dash, some of them even as low latency. Um, so that part is, is building. Um, I think the, the maturity, the technology is, um, the way we've defined all of this, the applications can be run as uh, HTML5 operator apps. Uh, they can be run as uh, other HTBTV apps, um, or they could be a native Android application. Um, so all of these are, are there to make it possible to rapidly deploy this uh, without having to re-engineer devices, television yeah. sets, what have you. Um, I, you know, I think the, uh, the market is changing. And, and the market is warming up to, to these kinds of things. Um, and we'll start seeing more of it. We'll start seeing more, as, as uh, Owen just alluded to, televisions that are only connected to the internet. Um, those sorts of things will, are, are coming within the next couple of years. So I don't think this is gonna, maybe not something that happens overnight now. We've, we've done a lot of work, we've seeded the market, and uh, it's time for, for those people to come along and say, let's go. Uh, let's form these organizations. I'll just add that, um, as uh, stated earlier in the presentation, um, we're using, the, the specification uses existing technical building blocks. So this really does facilitate um, uh, implementation of DDBI because a lot of the technology exists already and is actually already in different forms implemented in devices. So,
thank you both. Uh, thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, Paul, uh, for the webinar. I would encourage everybody who's interested in DVBI to join our webinar on Monday also. Um, as I mentioned at the start, Sophia Digital, uh, who were the chosen supplier uh, in response to a DVB RFP that was issued last year, are developing a reference client for DVBI. We would have been demonstrating that in Valencia, so you will get something of a demonstration of that during the webinar on Monday. Um, and you will learn a lot more on the uh, some of the questions indeed that have come up here in response to our webinar today. So thank you all for joining us. These slides are available now now on the DVB website and the video will be available a little bit later on today. Thank you and goodbye.